you a little bit about uh, some problems, um, violin technical problems that I encounter or people bring to me. Um, some of you may have seen some of these before, but that's fine. Uh, everything is helpful in repetition, I know. Um, and uh, let's see how we go. What I'd love you to do is if you have any questions, just type them in and uh, in about 20 minutes time, I will begin to answer them. So you can, you can do that. Now, if you want to join in with the session with the, the technical stuff that I'm gonna show you, it might be helpful for you to have one of these, which is quite a big rubber. And it might be helpful for you to have one of these, which is a pencil. Okay, so pencil and a rubber, it sounds like we're at school and I'm talking to you about violin technique and I've got a pencil and a rubber. Okay, but these might well be helpful. So, um, it seems strange to me that I am here to talk to you about violin or upper string technique, because it's not the thing that I care about most. Um, because actually what I care about is storytelling, creativity and music interpretation. Um, but uh, you can't get good at interpretation and creativity and storytelling if your body is letting you down. So it has become increasingly important to me as a uh, musician and as a teacher to address technical issues so that I can help other people free up their musicianship. So technique has actually developed into something really important for me in addition to musicianship. So I hope you've got your instrument with you. Here's mine. And I hope you've got your pencil and rubber just in case you need it. And I hope you can start typing your questions in and I will try to answer as many as I possibly can in the session. Now, often it's really important to start sessions like this with a joke. And I'm gonna try and do that. Um, it's a joke against me, um, and, but it explains why I'm talking to you about this stuff today, uh, the, techni the technical side of things. Um, there was a, I've had so many great teachers in my life, so many, um, uh, but one fairly, I'm gonna say far too recently, because I should have sorted all this out uh, uh, eight years and years and years ago with all the wonderful advice I'd had, told me, Alex, you're extremely talented. You just have two problems, your left hand and your right hand. Right, so uh, that's pretty fundamental to violin playing, isn't it? Bad left hand, bad right hand. So I, I, I examined all of that and uh, took it upon myself to try and sort myself out a little bit. So the first thing I want you to do is, I'm gonna try and help you with both hands in as short amount of time as I can, is if you just sort of shake your hands out, and particularly if you can sort of stand up and just drop your hands, could you notice what shape they get, they become? If you turn them this way, can you notice what shape your hands adopt? They're kind of beautiful, relaxed, kind of circle shapes. And I want you to notice that. That is the natural hand shape. Natural hand shape. And can you see, especially, can you see the shape of your thumbs? They are curved in the way. Okay, now I really want you to remember that. That is the most natural position for your hands is the thumb curved and the fingers curved beautifully inwards. And now, just very simply, if you can pretend that you're playing the violin or a viola and just keep those hands the same. See? And that's not far off what you need. So at the back of your mind, what I'd love you to feel always is that your hands are in their most natural shape as much as possible. And of course we need to stretch and, but the starting point, beautifully curved, thumbs that way, creating circles, easy, soft, circular hands. And the thumbs are really important. You wouldn't think that they were, you know, one, one of them just sits on the neck of the violin, you think, oh, it just sits there. And the other one holds the bow underneath. But if they're braced, either of them, if they're stiff, it creates problems. So really think about the lovely, beautiful, easy curvature of those thumbs. Now, I, during the course of this session, I want you to keep checking, keep checking your thumbs, okay? So uh, we're gonna start with the left hand. So, you know, my, my teacher said to me, I'm very good apart from my left hand and my right hand. So I'm gonna do a bit of work on the left hand and then I'm gonna switch to the right hand. So your basic hand position. Now, can you see that there's a lovely gap there? If I just put my, yeah, basic hand position and the thumb is nicely curved. Okay, 
and it just sits there and it can move. So that's the first thing I want you to practice is can you just put your hands in a beautiful relaxed position with the fingers nicely curved round. It doesn't really matter where they fall, just easy. And then turn the thing round and make sure that your thumb can sort of stroke the neck of the instrument easily. All right? Now, I'm going to show you something that I see a lot in players. And I want you to be honest with yourselves. And, and do you have this issue? Which is, I see a lot of this, which is that the thumb is gripping the neck of the violin. And can you see the muscle that bulges out here in my hand when that happens? Yeah, bulges out. And that creates tension. And what's interesting is, can I just show you that again? Here's the lovely relaxed hand. If you push that in, can you see what happens to my fingers at the same time? They kind of, they spasm slightly and they straighten. So a gripping thumb here causes problems with the, the fingers as well. And if you would like a suggestion on how you might want to fix that, if that's a problem, can you see if I brace there, can you see that? If I'm bracing there, can you see how stiff my fingers look now? And I'm not just, it's actually quite an effort to let them go. If you want a suggestion on how to release that, this is gonna sound bonkers, but it is 100% successful. Get quite a big rubber and put it between at the bottom of your thumb and, and first finger, and then play the violin. So you're holding the rubber and the neck of the violin, and you can still play. You can just try. And I, it's 100% successful because what is happening is two things. The rubber is stopping you from putting your hand too much too high up and it's also stopping the that movement there it gets in the way so it means that it's easier for you to keep uh fingers movable so i would recommend sounds crazy but i would recommend just trying what it feels like with a rubber quite a big one inserted between thumb and first finger let me just show you that one more time there it is and you can still move your Still move your fingers fine, okay? And don't do it all the time, just get a feeling of what that feels like to have a nice round and easy thumb. So I'm gonna put the rubber down now. Now the next thing, and I'm sorry if some of you have seen this before, is I'd like you to have a think about these knuckles in your left hand. Now this is called the, the base joint, the base joints in the hand. There's the hand, first joint, base joint, next joint, there, and the last one is the tip of the finger joint, yeah? And all of them should be beautifully soft, okay? So we're, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna do a very simple exercise in lifting fingers. And I want you to notice what happens. It's, I think this is hilarious. It's one of the things I love about this stuff is that you notice things about your body. So if you've got all your fingers on the string, lift the first finger away, base joint, beautiful. Nice and curved, beautiful. Check your thumb is still fine. Second finger, easy, no problem. Okay, all the other fingers still down. Now, what do you think happens next? Third finger, no problem, right? Ah, it's really difficult to do. It still works from the base joint, just about. Still works, but you can't lift it very far. Fourth finger, no problem. You can lift it miles back. That's what I would like you to think about. Can you do all of those fingers? And I'll explain the third finger in a minute. Can you lift them away from the strings using the base joint? Now, if you're finding it difficult to get your fingers over there, just bring your elbow around so that your fingers can more easily get over the strings. That should feel nice and easy to do though, okay? No, no pushing, no pushing, okay? Nice and easy. Now, the reason why that third finger is bonkers is because, I'm gonna give you a little biology lesson, the way the tendons in the hand work. So if I show you that finger there, the tendon goes all the way down, you can see that moving nicely in my arm. Second finger, same thing, you can see it's a slightly different place there. Third finger, can you see, there's a beautiful tendon that's moving there, but can you see what's also happening is that my fourth finger's coming too, and there's a little spasm in it, it's moving with it. 
And that's because this finger has its own tendon and sheath all the way down there. This finger has its own. The third and fourth do not have their own. They join together about here. So the third and fourth fingers are really tough to make work unless you're thinking away from the string. So the more you get like this, the harder the third and fourth finger will work. So what, that's why you need to get your elbow around a little bit more and give your fourth and third fingers the chance to be balanced over the string. And you can practice without the violin, just like that, just balanced over the string. Okay. So that's the first thing I want you to think about is uh, helping your third and fourth fingers because of the biological reasons. The next thing with the bass joints, this is where I start to bring in my favorite animals in the world is, can you think about a bull? And I'll just give you my little story about a bull. In a cartoon, there's this kind of snorting bull and Daffy Duck where somebody is about to fight with his, um, with his cape. And the bull's always incredibly angry with a ring through his nose and snorting. And you know, sometimes you see you know, fire coming out of the bull and they get very angry. And, and just before they charge, the bull tends to put his hoof on the ground and kind of <sighs> Now, can you see the way that the finger's moving? It's going back and then up like that. And that's what the bull's leg is doing, all the way from the hip, knee, ankle, foot, like that. And I'd like you to think about that image when you do some left-hand pizzicato. So with your fourth finger, anywhere you like, and I just want you to go. And it doesn't matter whether it sounds terrible or not, but you can see that you're pulling the string with your fourth finger and from the bass joint, Just easy as that. And that's the motion that will help you develop a more balanced hand and fourth finger. Okay, now there's a lot, any, people who have joined me on Facebook or on tutorials before will know that I love the way the fourth finger works. But this is such a good exercise just to get the feeling of hand position because it takes you up and over the string nicely enough and then away. Now, can you see, I'm just trying to show you the, the slow motion pull there and it's a kind of circle and the base joint is moving. So like the bull's foot. All right. Now, I love animals. Nature, the, na the natural world is incredibly helpful uh, to me, especially when I'm teaching. And uh, the other thing I love to think about with the, the finger work is uh, a scary tarantula. Now, if, you, um, if you've seen, if you've been to one of these bug parks where uh, the tarantula comes out from a little hole it's, it's, and it's coming face on, there's always this kind of one leg at a time thing, a bit like that. And I love the way that, that you can actually just think, look how wonderful nature is and can your fingers move in that same easy way. So have a look at Natural Geographic and, and if you can stomach it, go and, find a, go and find a program about spiders and just see the way that they're, they're all of their legs move in this beautiful way and just see whether you can develop that with your, how easy is it to, okay? Now, if you've got time, check out a fantastic YouTube, YouTube clip, which is Heifetz playing uh, Wieniawski Scherzo Tarantel in slow motion. So if you Googled that in YouTube or put it into YouTube and, and search for that, uh, you'll see one of the great left hands in action, Yasha Heifetz, and his finger work is amazing. You see how easy it is, but every single movement, small or large, is coming from the base joint. And the elbow is always in the, a supportive place to balance the hand so that he can do whatever he wishes. Okay, so that's a little uh, blast on left hand work. And now uh, we're going to talk about right hand work. Um, now, this is where you might need a pencil. So that's the first thing I want you to do is put your put your uh, hand into a beautiful bow hold. And we talk, remember the thumb. It's that way around. Nice circle. And with a pencil, it's dead easy because it's not very heavy. And I want you to wave like a baby. Hello. Lots of little baby waves when, when a tiny person starts to learn how to, you know, there's a lot of that, isn't there? Easy hand. And I just want you to do that with your pencil and just check that 
everything is fluid so no hitched shoulders or anything just beautifully easy with the wrist and then maybe you can do some circles so baby wave like this and then you can make you can make i'm just move back a bit so i can show you imagine you're painting a fence with these hor uh, vertical planks and you're going up and down and that your hand is the paintbrush with the, the bristles and the bristles are all fluid. Yeah, it's a, a nice image. And if any of you have seen the movie, The Karate Kid, the original one, there's a brilliant scene in that where Mr. Miyagi that, that makes his pupil, Daniel, paint his entire fence with that motion. So he's strengthening, but also being flexible. Up the, and then you can do the same thing but pretending to bow. And again, can you see that the, the, the knuckles, it's, the, it's almost the same as the left hand. There's the left hand, there's the right hand. And just turn the right hand round, and you've got a very natural shape. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for the most natural we can. Now, the next thing I'm doing is I'm just doing a little bit of a rock, just to make you feel like you're in touch with the bow. These two are, yeah. Just these two are easy. This one and this one, and just doing a little bit of rocking. And then when you're ready, you can switch to a bow to get that same movement. And what I would do is I would start not at the heel where the bow is really heavy, but I would start a little bit near the middle, near maybe the balance point so that the rocking is actually easier for you. So again, just do a little bit of waving, maybe just you know, make sure that your arm is nice and nice and easy, and then some rocking. And then what I quite like to do is I quite like to make sure that I'm in control of the bow. So I would, which just with the arm, easy, thumb nicely bent still, I would just draw some shapes with the tip. It's a circle and you can go the other way and you can see nothing is moving or everything's easy, but nothing else is moving except for the fingers, fingers and thumb. And then I can even do some nice and easy squares, triangles, And now I'm going to write my name. There we go. And my favorite is the figure of eight. And noth nothing feels any different except just balanced in the hand. And as you get stronger, we just move down there. Okay. And your hand is as natural and as easy as you possibly can. Now, I'm, I'm going to answer some questions now, but if you wanted to get into any more detail on those types of exercises, I am much more uh, conclusive and much more kind of uh, go into much more detail on previous sessions that I've done for the, the Benedetti sessions and before the virtual Benedetti sessions. So check out those tutorials um, and then uh, and check out the, the Facebook lives that I've done. Um, and remember, a fantastic technique and an easy technique will allow your uh, musicality to have much more impact because your body won't be letting you down. I was good, apart from my left hand and my right hand. So I thought about it and made those a bit better. Right, let's have a look at some questions. Um, here we are. The live, okay. Um, do you, right, let's just, here we, here we are, right. Tilting, okay, so the first question here that I've got is, any tips for tilting and bow change to run smoothly? Yes. So, um, the bow is this shape, okay? So it's not absolutely straight. And you can use the shape of the bow to help you with beautiful bow changes, but only if you think about it right. So what I'd like you to do with bow changes is not think that you're going down and up, down and up, but rather think that you're doing a, a figure of eight. And I was talking to you about a figure of eight now. So if you can think about right down, and then just as you're getting to the tip, you just, yes, so what I want you to think about is that the bow never ends. It's like a, a, a Mobius strip, if you can've got Mobius strip. 
So you go inside one line and then outside the other. So once you've started down the road, you can never stop. But you just keep going back on yourself. So that's the shape of the down and the up bow, not this. OK, so if I can just show you what I what I mean by that. So instead of going. What I'd like you to try is. Let me just stand up so I can show you a little bit better. I'm exaggerating, but here we go. Da. So not. But. So the arm and the bow is doing that, not this. It takes a little bit of getting used to, um, but that's how you need to do that. Right, next, see if I can find another question. Um, here they are. Uh, how do you stop the pinky finger from straightening on the bow hand? I can't keep it bent. Um, how do you stop it straightening? Okay, so that's what it looks like if it's straightened. And uh, I can answer this, but it's, it'll take you a little time just to, to fix it. Now, if it's straightened, can you see how white my knuckles are? Now, that means that there's a lot of tension there. It's there's a lot of blockage. And what we're looking for is the ability, and bearing in mind, everybody's got different hand shapes. But if your bow it's straight, then you're in control of the bow to some extent, but only because through rigidity. But what we need is to allow that just to soften down. Now, if you were to, um, I don't like to use the word strengthen too much, uh, but basically what you're missing is you're missing the ability to use the base joint uh, to its best degree. So again, if you go back to the pencil and just do those exercises that I've just showed you, which is getting this joint here just to move, what you'll do is you'll start to develop the little stabilizing muscles that will stop you needing to do that. So start with the pencil and just get that fourth finger to move. And actually you could start, the other thing is you could just lift it up and put it back down on the bow, like a tapping. So hold your bow and just practice tap, tap, tap. Okay, and then get to rocking. And as the muscles strengthen, or as your hand gets better balanced by using it better, then you can shift down the bow a little bit more and you'll have power, natural power, not forced power, okay? So you're right to want to fix the rigidity here because that will also help with the previous question of doing the smooth bow changes. Because in the end, the fingers are like uh, shock absorbers. If they're splayed, they can't, uh, they can't help you. So it's really, really good idea just to develop the movement, but it won't happen immediately. I can't just say, do this, I can only show you the process. So you need to just develop that movement there. Right, next question. Um, when doing double stops, my fingers tend to touch the other open string, creating muffled sound. I have to put my elbow slightly higher than usual for me to reach only my fingertips. Is this right? That's an excellent question. And the answer is yes, you're basically right. What we need to do with double stops is uh, understand that you, your arm might need to be balanced in a in a in a cleverer way. So especially if you're dealing with um, uh, if you're dealing with uh, thirds on the G and D string, in order to get there, your elbow might just need to give you a little bit of help. Okay. Now the danger there is that you put a lot of strain here if you're not careful. So the way to practice that is just can you develop a little bit of a swing so that when, when you are around at your fullest, you still feel easy. And then your double stops, you can just practice like you've just done uh, with the fourth finger from the bass joint. Yeah? And do them in little thirds. Okay? I've got another creature that, that I love to talk about with, with uh, double stops, which is the shovel-snouted lizard from Namibia. And if you check out a clip of the shovel snouted lizard from Namibia and he does a look the sand is so hot there that when he's out and about, the lizard can't keep more than two legs on the ground at once. So he's constantly shifting from in different combinations to get that to work. 
Um, so check out, there's a lovely YouTube clip of the a Namibian shovel snatted lizard doing, doing some dancing. And I always think that's just exactly what you need to be able to do with, um, uh, with double stops and thirds, especially. And again, if you think about his legs at the hand, then he's, uh, the lizard is, um, shift, uh, moving his, uh, limbs from the base joint. So yes, great question. Elbow will help you hand balanced over the strings that you need uh, and, and just try to keep uh, the tension really, really to a minimum. Right, next question. Um, do you have any tips? Well, we're tensing at the left hand. Uh, do you release the pressure once the next finger is placed down? So this is, do you have any tips for articulating the fingers well without tensing up the left hand? Uh, Okay, first of all, um, when you're talking about articulation, I think about articulation as being made, it's a type of sound and that comes from the right hand. So what I think you mean is clarity of finger work in the left hand. So uh, do I release? Uh, I love this question. Um, and the answer is, I like to feel that one can always play with what I call single fingers when it's most useful. So when your next finger needs to go somewhere else, it doesn't make sense for it to be down on the on the uh, down on the string all the time. So it needs to be ready to go to the next place. And if it can go there slightly early, it means that your bow will not get there first, and that your sound and your fingers will uh, will react so that it sounds correct. If that makes sense. Um, of course, that's overly simple. And sometimes if you've got a lot of passage work, it actually makes a lot of sense to keep the fingers down. But if you've got to go onto the next string, lift it, lift it early. And practicing the timing of that is the crucial thing. So I, I like to, uh, and especially if you're going down the instrument, it makes a lot of sense not to have all the fingers down uh, immediately or as a default setting, because then you might have to pick them up and move them again. So I, if you were doing a scale, I might put the fourth down on its own, and then I would have a decision to make about where to put the three. Is it on a sharp or a natural? Rather than going, oh, I need to move it. Does that make sense? So you've got to just think ahead about where your fingers need to be next. Right, I think we've got time for two more questions. Um, I'm so pleased, all of these. Uh, um, no, now there is a question, which is, do I have any tips for vibrato? I have lots of tips for vibrato and I promise you if I'm allowed to I will do a proper vibrato session uh, on Facebook or YouTube for Nikki uh, in the coming weeks. Vibrato is really hard to teach and it's a very individual thing but I've got lots of things that have helped me over the years with my own vibrato and also with teaching it. I will get to vibrato next week or the week after. Um, how do I relax the hand while doing circles with the bow? Uh, you, you need to you need to build up the weight carefully. So uh, the fingers should rock and little by little you will get easier. I think it's gonna be a minimum of a couple of weeks until you feel comfortable with the balance in your hand. So think about the seesaw and think about balance, not tension. Um, and to start with, if you're holding something, of course it's like lifting a weight, you're not, you're not used to it, but it's not the right thing to force that it's better to learn the, 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 the nuances of the bow. So if you can think about how to just, you know, react to the, the, the weight of the bow and just compensate for that reaction, uh, rather than forcing anything, that will slowly develop your hand into one that can be more balanced and you will find it easier and easier. Don't worry, no quick fixes, just believe in that process. Um, what's my favorite color? changes all the time. Um, I wear a lot of blue and pink, but actually I love green. Uh, I think, how do you get a steady grip of the bow? This is the last question. How do you get a steady grip of the bow? I often start with a good bow hold, but my fingers often shift up while I'm playing. Do you have any tips? That happens to me as well. And I think it probably happens to lots of people that sometimes the hand can get sweaty and things move. And also it's not necessarily um, the right thing to have the same bow hold all the time. Um, I spend plenty of time with my little finger up in the air on uh, for certain strokes, tremolo, if I'm at the tip of the bow. I think the important thing is, is just to think about resetting 
when you when you get the chance. If your fingers are shifting and they're into an unhelpful position, you just need to be aware of that and get used to spending more time in a good position. Again, please don't worry about any of this overly. It's just, uh, can you develop the process where your default setting, your usual bow hold is something that you feel more healthy with? It didn't happen overnight for me and I still work at it. I, I try to work at it in an easy way so I don't feel tense or awful, but I still do the exercises and I still try to make sure that my body feels free and that means that my bow fingers and bow hold can change and move as necessary, depending on what stroke I need. Uh, so that is it from me. What a treat. Um, I have one more thing to say, which is that Nikki herself will be on this channel in 15 minutes with her next wonderful session. So do join her then. And I will see you remotely, I think, during the course of today and tomorrow. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye.